Hello, everybody. Hello. Hey, nice to see you. Some familiar faces and some new faces. It's lovely when you um, come to a church and then there's a gap of a few months and you see some new faces and the family is growing. Lovely to be with you. Um, nice to see some familiar faces too. Um, I was so excited when Sarah said that the theme was youth. My goodness. I also... Guys, I absolutely loved your prayer points. Sarah sent me the prayer points that you've got for youth on the next slide. And I just love them. Um, there'll be a little summary for you in just a second. But um, how many of us know that youth are the next generation, right? And for you guys to be praying this in is just so heartwarming. I prayed it in with you throughout the week, but these were your dot points. Purpose, friendship, character, purity, passion, money, submission and honour, spiritual growth, discernment and hope. I loved every one of those amen and amen that they would be the prayers that we pray over our young people. On the um, next slide, I wanted to, um, I do need to apologise because my husband was going to be with me tonight, but our 16 year old um, had ACL surgery just a week ago. And so he's still recovering and we didn't want to leave him home alone, but that's the boys. And I've got their photo up because how much more timely is me up here talking about teens in the last fortnight, um, Peter, my husband and Khan and our son, our 16 year old, have written and published a book for youth. So it's written by a 16 year old with the guidance of his dad, but it's in young people language. So it'll give you a bit of a laugh, but um, it's really to, um, from one teen to another to help teens live wholeheartedly for Jesus. So if you know a teen, grab one. If you don't know a teen, grab one so you can find a teen. <laughs> if you know parents of teens, grab one. Um, and I say that because we had so much interest, which has been really heartwarming from schools and youth ministries, um, because there's something really powerful about a young kid sharing his faith. Um, for those of you in the front row uh, or on the media desk who know this child of ours, he's a rat bag. <laughs> He is not a perfect example of a Jesus-like teen, but he is a very real example of a Jesus-like teen. Um, and so the story's beautiful, but in there, come and have a look later and you can suss out the chapters. But as we talk about teens today, um, I want to read you a story, uh, or I want to read you some stats first, because... The stats are really a little bit dark around teens and also around young adults in the church. Let me read you this to preface what we want to pray into and continue to pray into. But this is um, some research taken straight out of um, the book and it says, research by scholars from the Australian National University, Deakin and Monash Universities reveal that over half of Australian teens identify as religious nuns, as in N-O-N-E-S. Half of them identify as religious nuns. That is, they do not affiliate with a religion. The researchers have found that Australian teens are divided into six main groups regarding their beliefs. They range from skeptics, 23% of Australian teens are skeptics, to indifferent, 15%, to spiritual but non-religious, 18% of them, to nominally religious, 19%, seekers are 8%, religiously committed are 17%. But here's the bombshell. <laughs> this means that only 17% of Australian teens are religiously devoted to their faith spanning not only Christianity, but also other faiths. Wow. So that percentage is actually not even indicative of Christianity. Wow. Now, if you think that's bad, the young adult stats are even worse. The young adult stats tell us um, in the last ABS uh, in 2021, here in Australia, tell us that only 8% of young adults in Australia are considered resilient disciples. Wow. Um of all 
young adults raised in Christian homes, only 8% are considered resilient disciples. And if you look up the definition of the 8%, it's absolutely like, it's just the, the 101. It's like they believe in God as a higher authority. Um, they believe in most aspects of the Bible. Um, they attend church at, um, at once a month. <laughs> and so the benchmark is really, really low. So guys, I get so excited when we talk about the next generation because the stats are not shiny. Yeah. And whilst this is a threat, it's also a beautiful opportunity. It's a beautiful opportunity for us to join together, turn things around. And as you prayed, watch the next generation rise up and be different. This is our kids. This is our grandkids. This is the future. But teens, we know what teens are like, right? I want to read you a story out of um, Kanan's book. <clears throat> okay, it goes like this. And this is to describe teens, right? The title is School Camp Fun. And he writes, there I, Kanan, was on a school camp with my grade 10 friends. A mix of boys roughed it in tents while others lounged in cabins. It's the last night and my mates and I are relaxing across our bunk beds at 3 a.m. Those dark blue vinyl mattresses have a way of unlocking the deepest chats. If you know, you know. We start talking about our future dreams and opinions on pretty much everything. But soon enough, the Red Bulls and the severe lack of sleep made us a little rowdy and the deep convos became a drag. That's when genius kicks in. One of the guys, grinning like he's just cracked the code to life, goes, want to chuck pebbles at the boys' tents? Under the spell of peer pressure and a dash, a dash of midnight madness, we turn into wild animals chucking pebbles at tents in the darkness. We stumbled upon what we think is another tent target, only to find one of our teachers stargazing. <laughs> <laughs> How do we record her and sell her audio alongside the book? <laughs> um, his deep voice cuts through the night. Gotcha. Busted. Yet the teacher is one of the kindest guys ever. He lets us off with a warning and a smile. You think we take the hint and stay in our beds until sunrise, yeah? Nope. <laughs> Peer pressure is real. Next minute, we had double the lads and double the mission to pull up the local beach and dig out a solid pit. Sounded like an elite idea in, a in our sleep deprived brains. So we sneaked off mission bound. After a decent walk, we reached the beach and got out our phones to start our selfie celebration and boom, two yellow headlights from a white van lit up the beach. <laughs> it was one of two things. One, we were about to get kidnapped or two, the teachers figured out we were no longer in our cabins. To cut a long story short, the kidnapping option would have been better. <laughs> okay. Now, look, in hindsight, we know that we made the wrong decision. We should have planned a better escape route. Kidding, <laughs> kind of. In all seriousness, that night taught us a lot about handling temptations and peer pressure. We were chasing a thrill, not thinking of the consequences we would face. Maybe if you were in our situation, you would have handled it differently. You're the type who'd be, etc., etc. This, that, <laughs> are the people we're talking about. Teens, risk takers. Know-it-alls, right. been there, done that, fearless, obnoxious, no sense of consequences, right? All of those things. In fact, I remembered um, uh, my sister, and I think last time I was here, I shared my sister's story with you, how she passed away a year ago. Um, it's crazy to think that, yeah, that was just a few months ago. but. Um, my sister was a psychologist and she used to say to me when I would complain to her about trying to rationalise with the kids and get through, especially um, when they were heated and it was debate time and here we were trying to have a rational conversation with them and I'd ring her up and I'd go, oh my gosh, have you got any tips? Because she dealt a lot with, um, with children in her counselling and with teens and she would say, hey, I'll give you a tip. <laughs> this is my tip. My tip is you need to wait. You need to wait till they calm down because the teenage brain, whilst all wired like that, is not listening to a thing you're saying. They do. In fact, she said to me that the teenage brain, when in that state, is like an adult brain on high doses of morphine. Oh. 
it changed the way I parent. <laughs> because why would I try and rationalise with an adult on high doses of morphine? <laughs> and here I was doing it with my teen. But that is the audience we're talking about. That is the audience that you guys are praying about. It's like, so Susie, is there any chance? <laughs> there is a chance because we believe in a big God. And more than that, there is a chance because the scripture gives us very real examples and we're just about to unpack a story of one of Jesus's miracles. Actually, it's the sixth miracle um, and it's the big catch of fish. And that's going to pop up on the screen in a moment. I want to read it out. But before we read it out, I want to remind us we don't exactly know how old the disciples were. Peter, John, uh, uh, Peter, John, James and son of Zebedee. We don't actually know exactly how old they were, but we are told that they were late teens or early young adults. And so this is the target market. Let's have a look at how they respond to this incident and what they do in the midst of this miracle so that we can just ignite our faith together and go, you know what? There is hope. And so I want to pick it up from Luke chapter 5. And uh, the whole story goes from verse 1 to verse 11. And it will pop up in a moment. We'll just read it together. It says, One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gisenerat, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. Now, there was a crowd at this scene because this was um, the Sea of Galilee and it was where healings would happen and miracles would happen. And so people were flocking to get around this man, Jesus. So it was very, very, very busy. It was hustle and bustle all over. Um, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Let's stop for just a moment. And I just want to um, have us visualise this scene. So the disciples have been fishing and they've fished all night and they've caught nothing. We're familiar with the story, right? The people are there, Jesus arrives, and the disciples have pulled their boats up to the sand and they're now washing their nets. The boats are empty and they're literally like, you know, it's been a tough day in the office. Here. They're washing their nets. It's a sign of complete despondence. They're deflated, depleted. They're not new to this. They know how to fish. They know what to do, but there's nothing in the boats. And this is the scene that we're looking at right here. And so it says, oh, sorry, let's go back one. Um, he got into one of the boats. This is Jesus, the one be uh, belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then Jesus sits in his boat and taught the people from the boat. And I know the typical sermon line around here is, yeah, when we're lonely and when we're despondent, Jesus jumps into our boat and that can speak to us, but that's not where I'm going with it tonight. But that is beautiful. And I received that during the week as I was preparing this. Verse four, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, just remember, we're talking about young people here. Now, I want you to have a little guess with me. As a teen or a young adult, what do you think they would have thought and said to Jesus when he was like, guys, go out into the deep, it's broad daylight, put out your nets, and I'm telling you, you're going to catch a catch. What do you think their response was? You're crazy. I've done that. <laughs> I mean, all of us who are parents in this room, we actually know the line, I've done that. It doesn't work. What are you even talking about? <laughs> and so I imagine that they were saying this to Jesus. Then we move on to verse five. And Simon Peter, just as we've guessed, he answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. Because he's thinking, what on earth, Jesus, are you even talking about? We have been fishing all night. Now, correct us if we're wrong, but you are not the fisherman who comes from fishing families. We are. <laughs> like, for a start, we know what we're doing. Secondly, like, you're such a rookie to even think that fish are going to come out in the middle of the day. They don't do that. We fish at night, right? However, we've been following you around and we've seen that you've performed a few miracles and you're pretty amazing and there's no one like you. So for the record, we're just going to take a gamble on you and do as you say. <laughs> and this is what happens. We will let down our nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break 
So they signalled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Now, I don't know about you, but I've read most Bible stories over and over again, and they use, they lose their glamour. They lose their, oh my goodness, what on earth did I just read factor because we're so familiar with them. But these guys had just observed something that they'd never observed before. It defies the rules of fishing. They'd caught nothing and now both boats were full, overflowing, that they're like in complete disbelief. They call their friends. I think it's just so mild here, but they, they must have been going, oh my gosh, guys, come and have a look. Crazy town, right? And so... Don't go to the next screen yet, Alan, but what do they actually do at this point? I want to read you what the disciples do. What do they do when this happens? <coughs> this is actually a fun book that my husband um, published about, I think it's nine months old, and it's about the declining stats around young adults leaving the church and solutions for how, um, or propositions for how that stat can be reversed. But um, I'm just at one, uh, page 134. This is what the disciples did, you guys, after this miracle. These clever disciples quickly appointed Jesus as the CEO of their fishing enterprise. <laughs> A brilliant win-win deal was struck on the seashore. Jesus agreed to work part-time commanding fish into their nets, while the disciples pioneered a franchising arm of the business. Talk about an inventive way to lighten the load, multiplying revenue and expand their market share. The profits were halved to fund Jesus's upcoming mission trips. Jeez, uh, John even booked a holiday to a Greek island. <laughs> Galilee was in for the greatest economic boom in decades with the largest fishing market Israel had ever seen and a revolutionary grand opening of a bakery branded the 12 baskets full was about to launch. Shut up. Is that what they did? <laughs> Certainly not. What did they do? And verse 8 tells us this. Verse 8 tells us their crazy response. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that had uh, they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Let's just park here for a moment. These guys were very, very professional fishermen. They were not high school dropouts. They were all apprentices of the rabbi Jesus. So they had actually done what we would call Bible college. Yeah? They'd completed Bible college and it wasn't like it is today where if you just get a 70 ATAR or whatever it is, you can sign up and go to Bible college and you can do your thing. No, it was very, very difficult with very stringent entry fees for um, young uh, disciples to enter into rabbinic school and actually come in under the guidance and the teaching of a rabbi. And so they had gone through some very stringent measures to actually finish their degrees. Not just that, but they had all come from fishing families. This was like the family business of family businesses. These guys were experts. In fact, some scholars actually tell us that they, um, that John, for example, probably owned a few houses not far away from, the, uh, from uh, Galilee. And also suggest that let's not forget that John was actually called to Cyphus' house around the trial of Jesus. So he must have known people in high places, right? No ordinary guy. Uh-huh. We're also told that Simon um, or Zebedee actually owned multiple boats on the Sea of Galilee and had many men working for him. These guys came from very successful business families, very successful fishermen heritage. 
History also tells us that fish that were caught in the Sea of Galilee were actually the freshest fish, fish, <laughs> fish around and were sent off to all around the world because it was so fresh that it would survive the travel. And then they go on to say that fish that was salted that came out of the Sea of Galilee could even go as far as Rome which was really, really far. So these guys were not just trained fishermen. They came from very, very, very wealthy places. They had very, very, very wealthy futures ahead of them. They were living the good life. They were not only fishermen, but they were marketers because they knew how to actually distribute the fish. They were also distribution channels like Move Over Amazon. <laughs> These guys had a very good future ahead of them. They didn't need to follow Jesus. They didn't need to find a new career path because back in the day, you just did what your family did. So why on earth would they throw all of that away and all that future security to follow this man, Jesus? And I want to suggest that in order for us, our teens, anyone, to actually leave it all behind and follow Jesus, we've got to actually not just like Jesus, but want to be like Jesus. We've also got to understand where it is we're going with Jesus. Yeah. Because if Jesus just turns up and says, hey, let me take you on a bus ride half an hour from here. I'm like, yeah, great, fun, but what do we do next? You see, these guys were not unsure on what comes next. They were Jewish boys who had gone through the system and what they understood about following a rabbi was that following a rabbi meant one thing. Your whole life's goal was to be like the rabbi. Your whole life's goal was to be like the rabbi. So they understood what they were signing up for. When in the next verse, verse 11, it says, so they pulled their boats up to shore, left everything and followed him. Now with that backstory, that's pretty crazy, right? Yeah. They were already living the good life. Let's go back to the fact that they were teens and young adults. Chances are, you and I don't brush shoulders with a lot of teens and young adults who could just inherit their parents' business, who were very elite, who had their future sorted out to then leave everything and follow Jesus. But you see, the only reason they could do that is because they wanted to be like Jesus. He gave them another idea of what it looked like to not just live the good life, but to live the best life. Jesus showed them a possibility for their future, and that was to be like him. And so, friends, on the next screen, I have a couple of ideas for us. What is our role in the life of teens what is our role? Because we can get here, you know, we can come together and we can say, we're praying for teens. It's all up to them. We do our bit. We're going to pray. We're going to fast. All these things are absolutely critical and necessary because, hey, the supernatural move of God in their life and the revelations and insights that God, that we need God to do in their life is absolutely number one. So, yes. But what's our responsibility in this? So that we don't just put the burden on them and go, teens, they're so hard. Negotiating with them is like negotiating with someone on high doses of morphine. You can never get through. I may as well hit my head against a wall. Like, seriously, maybe I... You see, our role as adults is not just to pray. Because that's the easy part. Hard, easy, easy, hard. But that's the, that's just scraping the bottom of the barrel, right? Our role as adults 
is to show them Jesus. Because you see, the reason they were able to leave everything and follow Jesus is because they saw Jesus clearly. Now you, us, we don't have Jesus in the flesh, but we've got each other who are Jesus on earth to show our teens, the teens of our, ch of our friends, the teens at school, the teens in the community, the teens who are teens that turn up to our houses because they're connected to our kids, whatever. Our job is to show them Jesus. Our job is that they would go, oh, <laughs> is that what it looks like? If we give them a better picture and a better vision for what it looks like to follow Jesus, they've got more of a chance of following Jesus because research tells us that young adults, so that's, that's the next step for teens, right? Probably teens aren't yet thinking that, but the research suggests that young adults, so once they hit 18 to 34 in that bracket, are actually seeing the church as completely irrelevant to their life. Research also tells us that young adults, the next step on from teens, don't actually believe in the pie in the sky anymore. They're not moved by what if there is a 1% chance that you might die tomorrow and end up in hell. They want a real valid reason for the here and now. That is the generation that we are ministering to. That is the generation that we are interacting with. They want a here and now. They want to see Jesus in their midst. They want to see how Jesus can make their future better. They want to see how Jesus can give them the best life, not just a good life. Because the world is very, very tempting, even for us adults who should have our heads screwed on, right? Let alone when you're a kid with hormones flying everywhere and when you don't actually even know who you stand for yet. Yeah, I think. And so our teens, friends, need to see Jesus in us. When the disciples saw Jesus, they left everything because they wanted to be like him. And we're not raising, um, I'm not suggesting that we raise teens that go, oh my gosh, I just want to be like you, no. But I am saying that we want teens to look at us and go, oh my gosh, I want to be like you because you just represent Jesus so well. You help me understand what Jesus looks like in the way that you deal with people, in the way that, like Pete said, you spend your money, in the way that you use your hands, in the way that you have an inner life that is, this is another thing the research tells us. The teens and young adults are actually disillusioned by the hypocrisy in the church. They're not looking at kids, their peers, they're looking at us adults. Yep. Yep. Sometimes friends, we might be the reason that they are not deciding to follow Jesus. We need to own that, that's some hard truth. But we need to own that. We need to be the example, the Jesus hands and feet, the living example that they look at so that they can go, I wanna be like you because you represent Jesus. And secondly, we want to demonstrate and model and show our teens that the goal is way greater than a ticket to heaven. That's like the entry point. That's salvation. But then what about sanctification? What about transformation? So we want to model to our kids, to the teens in our world. We want to come alongside. I'm looking at some of you and I'm sure you've raised your kids by now. But surely you have friends who are still raising their kids. Come alongside them. And together, let's make it really clear to our teens that, hey, I'm so glad that you made a decision to follow Jesus, but that's step one. The rest of our lives is to be transformed into the image of Jesus, to become like Jesus, because salvation is we are saved from the penalty of sin and then we are saved from the bondage of sin and then we are safe from the body of sin right it's a process so we need to talk like we believe that Christianity and following Jesus is about transformation so that their benchmarks are correct because you see we don't just want them to stay in church until 
the end of year 12. My husband and I run a ministry called Gen J, Generation Jesus. And we, we completely niche into working with young adult pastors and leaders, with young adult ministries in churches. And one of their biggest concerns is what do we do with our year 12s? Because it's so hard to keep them at the end of that year. Because maybe, just maybe, those year 12s at some point signed up to the fact that if I put my hand up, I'm guaranteed a ticket to heaven when I die. And they've forgotten that there's an in-between that we need to live like Jesus on earth. And then when push comes to shove because there's nothing really substantial and worth living for, they drift away and go, well, I got the ticket. I'll just do what I want. And then, you know, when I'm getting old or when I start to, you know, feel like my life might be coming to an end or maybe when my own kids are off the rails then I might come back. <laughs> That's not what we're signing people up for. And so what's our responsibility as adults? Our responsibility is to pray first and foremost. I didn't put that up, that's the obvious. You guys are already faithfully doing that so beautifully. But we wanna show them what Jesus looks like because that's what led the disciples to leave everything and follow. We are Jesus's representatives and two, we wanna make sure that they're clear on the fact that living for Jesus is a life of transformation because that's how to keep them. I'm sure that if I said, guys, put your hand up, if you're praying that they would just come to Jesus and then at some, if they fall away, if they go off and do their own thing, that we're all okay with that because at least they put their hand up once. And at some point, Jesus will find them. I'm not trying to be theological. I'm not going there at all. But what I'm saying is none of us would subscribe to that. We're all like, no, we want them to live like Jesus because their future families want them to live like Jesus, because their future colleagues really want them to live like Jesus, because their friends want them to live like Jesus, because the decisions that they're gonna be making in future really need them to live like Jesus. So we have a role to play too. And I know that None of you are sitting here going, <clears throat> that's a bit hard. Because I have a sense that most of you are sitting here going, I want to do that. I want to do that. And so whilst we're praying for teens, I want to flip it around a little bit as well and add, an, add another dynamic that the outcome of what happens to our teens lies in some great components on how we live our life like Jesus. And so friends, I wanna encourage us together. Our teens are watching, they're watching, and they might be quick and amazing and fluent at saying things like, what would you know? I heard one of my kids saying the other day, oh, my mum always exaggerates that because I was saying something and they thought I was a little bit over the top with it. You see, at face value, it doesn't really look like they think we're amazing or that they're watching too hard, but they really are. They really are. I just said to um, a, 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 someone I was having a meeting with just the other day, I said, oh, um, my, son, uh, my son's girlfriend, um, he loves this aspect of her personality. Um, and she said, well, that's no surprise because that's what his mum's like. And I was like, Oh, that's funny, but I'll take the compliment. And she was like, no, no, no. Have you ever spoken to a psychologist? That's what they say. Boys in particular look for things they love about their wife and their mums and subconsciously they search for those. And so for the mums in the room, oh my gosh, the mantle on us, huge, huge. And so we're just going to open up and pray for two things. For those of you who have teens or young adults or have close friends who do, we'd love to pray for you. 
And then for those of you who are like, wow, I really want to get very serious about living like Jesus because the teens and the young adults in my world are watching. We want to pray for you next. Is that okay? How shall we do this, you guys? Did you leave? Annie? Yep. Do you... you okay. Yep, I... Just before we go there, I wonder whether some of you know some teens in your world, whether yours or they belong to someone you love. And they're a little bit of a riot right now. And you're like, oh my gosh, gosh, where I'm so far from what you've said, Susie, because we need to backtrack because they are not interested in Jesus at all. Yeah. And if that's you, would you just slip up your hand? Bye. Just want to start by praying for you guys. Actually, why don't you, I was going to keep you where you are, but why don't you actually break the ice and come to the front? And maybe you guys just, yeah, even in front of your chair, you don't have to come up too far, whatever, but how about, Pete, do you want to put that oil to good use? Father God, for those hands that went up, representing teens that actually are far from you, whether they are our own or whether they belong to people we love and care for. I want to pray in the mighty name of Jesus. The most miraculous interception by your spirit over these kids. Father, there is no way that we can love these kids more than you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to pray that these kids would actually have a bad taste in their mouth for things that the world offers in the name of Jesus, that somehow things would taste sour. And Father God, as parents, we're so fast to protect our kids from crying or being sad. But I think that some of you are going to actually watch your kids cry or be sad in the next little while. And you're going to be so heartbroken and you're going to, you're going to want to save them and, and take them out of that and, and, and heal their pain and tend to their broken hearts. And I'm not saying that God is saying this and I, I preface this with it. It's just my sense. But if it's not for you, please don't take it. But I just want to spit out that if that is you in the next few weeks, that you would refrain from trying to hurry them out of this sadness that might actually be quite strategic, that it might actually be the very thing that makes them hate what they're doing so much to realise that the world is so empty and so pointless and so short term. And so instead of pulling them out of their sadness, trying to cheer them up, just pray hard and pray that the sadness and the disruption would actually lead to some deep conviction and then an encounter with sweet Jesus. And Father, I also want to pray that the teens represented by those who have responded to prayer right now, Father, that somehow by your miraculous, supernatural, strange and unexpected ways that you would intercept them and that you would surround them with good friends in the name of Jesus, Father God. The scripture says the prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. Hear the prayers of these parents or representatives in the name of Jesus, I pray. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you. And I feel to 
tell each of you that we are all standing together in this. We are all like your kids are our kids. Our kids are your kids. We are all in this together. Father, put a fire in our belly to pray passionately like they were our own flesh and blood. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And for the other teens represented in any way in this room, Father God, I want to pray that those teens would go the next level in you in the name of Jesus. That those teens would get into scripture and learn how to hear from you in the name of Jesus. That those teens would have divine conversations with people that help them make sense of what they've signed up for in the name of Jesus. And finally, Father, for us, for us who want to respond to your call tonight, to live like Jesus because our teens are watching, can we stand to our feet? If you want to live like Jesus in a way more intentional way, if you want to have your devotion or quiet time behind closed doors and get intentional and want God to give you creative ideas and open up creative conversations and divine conversations where you might be able to encounter a teen and and, and where it would just be so natural and not forced. Would you have ears to hear where the Spirit says, hey, tell them what you read this morning. Father, we open ourselves up to you. We open ourselves up to you afresh and we say we want to live like Jesus on earth. We want to be little Jesuses roaming the earth. We want to be a people who believe in a transformed life. And Father, we want to pray that those watching us would watch us even harder and have more reason to see you in us. Thank you, Lord. Again, we're in this together, guys. We're in this together. We're marching our feet. We're stomping our feet. And we're in this together to say we want to live like Jesus because it makes a difference. It caused those disciples to leave all. They didn't even try and work out what to do with all the fish. In this moment, I'm thinking to myself, gosh, if that was me, I'd be like, okay, hang on, I don't want to be irresponsible. Let me just put these up on Marketplace and at least just try and make some money and feed the poor with it. And then I'll be, I'll I'll come, I promise I'll be following you. But this is like next level. This is like nothing else matters. An abandonment that is ridiculous. Father, I don't really know how to be like that. But I do know that all you want is our yes. Yes. And the rest is up to you. Prompt us, guide us, speak to us. Surround us with people who have good wisdom and insight and revelation and discernment. We love you. We love you. We love you. I want to thank you for this beautiful church. A blessing over each and every individual. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.